Hey, in today's conversation, you're going to meet Mark Ford, who's one of the partners in the Agora companies, the um, billion dollar plus subscription um, revenue business in financial publishing, kind of dominated the financial publishing space for the last you know decade and or more. Um, and he says something remarkable, actually he says a lot of remarkable things, but one thing in particular really stood out. And he talks about why sometimes he thinks that we're at the end of the industry. And that is a stunning statement from Mark of all people. Um, obviously they have a huge, huge business. Um, he's been in the business for 30 years. Um, there are parts of it that he's um, pessimistic on and parts of it that he's optimistic on. And he talks about that in this conversation. And then we also kind of dig in to a conversation um, to start with about kind of what it takes to scale online, how to engage investors. What are the frameworks that Mark uses to think about a publishing business? Um, and some of the pitfalls and, and problems with the way a lot of copywriters and, and publishers approach the business. And so there's a, there's a whole lot of information in here. This is all real business building advice from somebody who's helped build um, one of the biggest companies in the space. Um, and it's, it's more and more relevant for not just the trader educators and publishers in the space and in the media uh, space. Uh, it, it's getting more and more important for people in the fintech space, people who are trying to build um, new publishing assets around other revenue models. And when we talk about the future of the space, uh, I think those of you who've been paying attention to the FMS kind of conversations that I've been having about things like the, the coming strategy model um, competition, the increased media cost and click competition, you'll see that Mark is right on the same page with me on all of this. And so um, the things that we're talking about are things that um, the biggest company in the space is, is thinking about and trying to solve as well as um, as all of you. So I think you're gonna love this conversation. Forget all the marketing secrets. This is real business building advice. We're talking about our industry, about retail investor audiences, and I think you're gonna really enjoy it. All right, well, thanks Mark for joining me today. I'm really excited to have you on um, to talk with the Financial Marketing Summit community about uh, the industry trends right now. Um, so thanks for being here. Uh, great to be with you, John. So. Um, for the last, I mean, obviously, if I, if I remember the story right, I think you joined Agora when maybe it was somewhere around $6 million in, in revenue or something like that. And obviously yeah. it's grown into a behemoth of a business. Right. Um, and you've had a, a huge impact on the industry. Uh, you guys have been the, the dominant player in the industry. And then now in 2022, uh, we were kind of in, in a period of time where I feel like there's um, a, just a lot of things changing in the industry. And so... Um, first and foremost, we have the, uh, the increased regulation kind of or regulatory attention, I should say from the FTC and kind of the impacts that's having on the business. We have, right. um, the mainstreaming of the, the industry, um, becoming a much bigger industry as our, uh, customer base grows. And as more and more individual investors become do it yourself investors and come online looking for, um, information. Um, and then we have all these intersections, intersections with FinTech, intersections with um, other like digital platforms like broker dealers, capital markets. Um, and I did an interview with a gentleman named uh, Ian Rosen, who was the GM of uh, MarketWatch at one point and C or CEO of StockTwits. Um, and they're part of a, he's part of a FinTech called Tiffin and they just raised a hundred million dollars and they're buying up a bunch of you know, small publishers. And he had a really interesting point. And he's like, you know, from the tech perspective, um, it used to be that developing technology in FinTech, that was the hard thing, but that's not really the hard thing for those guys anymore. The hard thing is what you guys have done, which is build audience, particularly at scale within the financial sector. And that is the most valuable thing right now. Um, and I think that, you know, first and foremost, I, I, I'd love to get your take on what it is that engages investors, right? Because uh, traditionally the, the newsletter space, I would say, you know, focus on alternatives, had personalities, but you guys have become the masters of this model of using content and promotion to engage investors. So when you think about what ideas sell or engage investors? Like, how do you even think about that from a framework? Um, well, um, excuse me. <laughs> well, there's a very traditional way of looking at it, which is to imagine that uh, investors or rather people that um, are willing to pay money to get investment information are motivated by either fear or greed. And um, 
here certainly plays a role with many, with many um, of our customers, but um, greed, I think, is um, a bad term to use because it, um, it short circuits all the other emotions that are at play when people um, are uh, looking to improve their, their stock market portfolio performance or their wealth. And in fact, it, greed is probably a, a very rare motivation. It's mostly about other things like um, self-esteem and, uh, and uh, writing wrongs and, uh, and also curiosity and uh, also worldview. A big part of it has to do with people's individual views of how the world should be. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have some of our most successful advertising campaigns were those that that didn't actually offer any solutions in terms of uh, investment gains, but just mm -hmm. uh, the prospect of getting investment advice from somebody who had a like-minded view of the world. I think so that, I think, go ahead. Well, uh, well, I'm just going to hone in on that. The worldview aspect, I feel like, is one of those things that has been it's easily lost, especially in um, people who come at this um, business from kind of learning a copywriting perspective or um, they're coming at it from a very active trading perspective. Um, and they're thinking about like the technical analysis. They're thinking about um, maybe individual stock picks, but they're not right. stepping back and saying, no, like when you build a franchise or you're building a publication, you, you have to take a view on the world and be able to communicate that. So, I right. mean, that's a pretty, do you think that's pretty foundational then to, um, yeah, like, absolutely. Your other messaging? Yeah. It's, it's, and I can understand how now with them, if somebody's coming into the business now as a younger person, you might think it's all about trading and, and profits, but you're, you're not going to really build a big file that way where, you know, Agora's, I don't know how, how big are, are, unpaid file is it's you know, three or four million, maybe five million, but the paid file is a million and a half. And that's not counting a major part of our business that we just sold. And uh, you can't get those kind of numbers. You know, uh, traders are represent, you know, maybe at best 5% of our, our files. And people, you know, and certainly professional traders are, are really not the target. We're we're looking for individual amateur investors that want help, and the, the traders among them are a small percentage of your file. So, if you want to if you want to develop the file of of a thousand people willing to pay you ten thousand dollars, you're going to need um, at least fifty thousand subscribers, paid subscribers, to listen to your general investment advice. So, yes. Um, it would be a mistake to think that it's all about profits and making quick bucks and so on. And, and, and often the younger copywriters, that's something that the situation have to deal with because they have, it's hard for them to believe that if they go for a longer gain in terms of developing a relationship with a customer, that in the end, um, everybody will be better off, including them because their, uh, their royalties will be longer and, stronger yeah and that's like i remember the like these old great magalog packages right i mean you go back to the book of logs like plague of the black debt and i remember there was a promo i think it was ignore china lose money and it's these big macro kind of theses and right. it seemed like the, the copy was selling kind of a, a macro um in um view on the world and then the back ends were much more like active but the front end products and ideas were these big kind of macro trends right. um, often. Uh, and then I feel like it's probably like the last five, six years that this kind of uptick in active trading, everybody got so excited about, I would say, some of the um, trader educators on, on that use a lot of social who have maybe a younger demographic and they're thinking, oh, well, this is the future. But like demographically, that's still, you know, the, right. the, the younger, younger, I mean, the first millennial just hit 40 last year. Um, our market is still very much an older, um, 
investor because that's when you get really serious about the markets is my right. view. Right. Um, and so the, I feel like though there was this boom in trading promos that maybe because part of it was we had the, the crypto boom and we had right. um, the cannabis boom. And so I feel like a lot of the copywriters that came up um, and I say this as somebody who was a copywriter for years. I, I was I used to write for Clayton Makepeace, and um, uh, I worked in the trading niche when I started. And it seemed like the the trading promos were so much focused on gains, big winners, and systems mm -hmm. that you have a generation of copywriters that don't understand how to write yeah. a, a, a big idea promo. Or yeah, a, I agree. I agree with you. <laughs> and and they um, and they also they find it difficult to write. Um, those type of promos under strict regulatory controls because um, you know when the um, you know we talked about it before the FTC has uh, has been pretty active we we had a, a, a dealing with them ourselves and um, and their their rules are you know they're tough they're reasonable rules. But um, what they're trying to eliminate, I think correctly, is, um, you know, people that are giving uh, misleading impressions about track record, for example, for an mm -hmm. analyst track record by cherry picking winners and so on. And, um, and if that's your only game, you know, if that's as a copywriter, if, if the only thing you know how to do is just, you know, look at uh, the track record and extrapolate, extract cherry picked uh, examples and, and put them repeatedly on a page and what, what are you going to do when that you're not allowed to do that anymore? Right. And there's plenty, there's plenty to do. Uh, uh, plenty of successful packages that can be written, but you need, you need more arrows in your quiver than that. And uh, mm -hmm. that's not to say, however, that uh, big idea packages uh, always work. And, you know, as I've explained to my, uh, my partners, Many times that uh, big idea packages only work about twenty percent of the time, thirty percent of the time. Most of the time, it's very conventional packages. I'm not talking about trading greed, you know, hyper. Uh, there's a big difference between front end and back end. But there are two or three, and uh, and Clayton knew this better than anybody. There are two or three general, I would say, um, approaches to um, um, or aspects of investor. Uh, well, I'm going to just say investor for the moment, not, you know, although we know that many of our subscribers are, don't actually invest. They just like reading about it, but we call them investors. Investor psychology is, um, is um, so you have the, let, let's take a quick look. You have these macroeconomic people, the people that have a view of how the world works from the macroeconomic point of view, the permit bears and so on, and they want to buy your newsletter to prove that they're right about their economic theories. Then you have, there's a version of them that's different. The, there's a version of kind of a um, uh, fire and brimstone gold guys uh, that uh, feel that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Uh, these two overlap, but it's a different uh, approach. Then there are the investors who believe that the way to get wealthy is through little tricks and gimmicks. You know, there's little things you can do. You know, you save a little money in tax, you try this over there, you invest on Monday morning instead of Monday afternoon. And, and that's a whole different mentality. And then there's people who their primary interest, and these are mostly people that are retired or just about to retire, is income. And uh, what they want to know is how they can boost their income. So there are those in there, probably two or three others I haven't mentioned. Mm -hmm. But what you'll see in the market, if you if you have a perch like I've been lucky to have over the past 20 years of having, you know, I don't know, 60 or 80 uh, promotions that are going out every month that uh, I can look at inside and out and see the results on, you'll see that there are waves. There are always waves. And you go through all these different um, um, aspects, um, aspects of, Buyer uh, psychology, you know the, the things that appeal. Uh, sometimes, you know, huge gains appeal, but sometimes, um, like small dollar amounts, you know, how to put an extra three hundred dollars is more powerful or more believable 
than how to make uh, you know three hundred sixty percent on your max. So um, so these things go back and forth, and of course that's um, that's one issue. And then the other issue for the copywriters, you've got your, the product that you're selling, which is an actual thing with a real track record, and you can't make it turn into just anything. And so um, that's a you know. That's another issue too. Some, you know, again, from our perspective, it's one we could manage because we could put, um, we could, you know, take a third of our promotions, keep them going, uh, keep the back ends going, but not do any front end promotions because we know that whole uh, approach is just not going to work for another six months or a year. So, and right. and there's no certain way of knowing, you know, when these things are coming and, and going. So. So when you build a franchise, I mean, like, it seems to me like the, you know, you have these different market segments um, and the, 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 the worldview that you present, like that, I remember when you launched Palm Beach Letter, you had a very kind of clear um, worldview. You had a very clear kind of um, even a tone to it that is very different than say some of the war financial um, right. um, franchises right. um, that were much more aggressive. So or do you think, are you, how much overlap is there between these kind of like, you know, you have the guys, like you said, who are, who are like looking for little tricks. It's a different mentality. So you have these different mentalities of investors in a general franchise. Like I can't imagine you're tapping more than two or three of those really consistently then because they can be pretty, pretty very like varied, right? Like the, the super active options trader is very different than um, the income in, um, investor. Um, okay, I'm not quite sure I understood the question, but <laughs> let me ask the, the let me answer a question that I, I thought you might have asked, um, which is that um, you can have a franchise. You know, generally what we've done is um, you create a franchise that has a certain that's that's based in not it must be based on the key idea person in that franchise. Let's just say it's an analyst, um, and then. From that franchise, you develop backends that are appropriate to it. Now, if, you're, if your guru, your analyst, has any integrity, he's only going to allow you to do certain kinds of backends. So when I was writing the front end for um, Palm Beach Letter, you know, I, I was not interested in promoting any backends that I didn't feel were useful. So as far as, you know, I was willing to sell uh, uh, an option service that uh, that sold puts, but not you know uh, not many other things. But it turned out that that was fine because um, I was able to you know engage with um, the, the 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 trader that was going to be recommending, and we came up with a system that reflected my own point of view and even a few new bells and whistles that I thought was clever that uh, I took credit for. And um, and we it sold very well, and it, it it was really kind of a bread and butter version of uh, you know selling puts uh, with um, a couple little twists, but it was wrapped in uh, it was wrapped in me and my very conservative approach to investing, and so people felt. Um, in fact, we sold hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe over over a million dollars worth of that product before we ever launched the product. Just by me talking about what I was doing editorially and asking them if you wanted to sign up for a, um, a hot list, you know, uh, so when we bring it out and we, I mean, those people just, they didn't even read the promotion and just signed up. Well, that's, I think that's, I mean, there's a couple of things that come to mind of that. One is, I mean, first and foremost is um, I've read your editorial quite a bit and your, your promotions and your editorial is so smoothly transitions. It feels like into, um, uh, promotion without even trying that you can't even tell the difference when, when it's, when it was, when it was, especially in the, in the early days of Palm Beach letter, right. when you were really writing a lot there, right. I don't think you could tell the difference easily between uh, your promotion and your right. editorial, um, yeah. which is, I think a remarkable thing for, for people to notice. Well, I'm, you know, I've always said to copywriters that the only difference between good copy and good editorial writing is if one is selling an idea and one is selling a, a manifestation of an idea. That's the only difference. And it's very little difference. So, yeah. and what I was selling when I was, in other words, I, for me, there was no difference. I was writing about, you know, my skepticism of options. And now I've learned this and I learned this, and this is all true. And 
but I knew that people would be interested because I knew that I had a, you know, one of the advantages I've had in our business since the very beginning is I've never been interested in investing. And so I've learned very little and I've, I've maintained a level of ignorance that represents beginning enthusiasts. You know, I kind of know all the terms, but uh, I don't really know and I don't really want to know. It feels painful to me. So when I decided that we had to have, you know, I had to have a, a backhand service to make the thing viable, I just let people come along with me, showed them my, my doubts and concerns, and then, and then showed them how this uh, uh, Tom Dyson, who was uh, my younger partner, who was showing me how to do it right, getting excited about the discoveries. And so it was all genuine. And, uh, and there, it was seamless because there wasn't any, I was literally selling the idea of, um, you know, as, as this type of option strategy as I was discovering it. You know, one of my best, <laughs> one of my most productive emails, I don't know what I attached it to, but was an email. I was, I was 60 something when I was writing it and I had just read my, I've been in the business now for over 30 years at this time. And I read, I just read my first book on Warren Buffett. And I wrote an essay about how amazing Warren Buffett is and what <laughs> Warren Buffett. And this thing sold like gangbusters. Um, I forget what it was. We, what we attached to it might have been a, even a free premium or whatever, but I got a huge response. And I just, you know, it just shows you that we often underestimate the, um, the level of sophistication of most of our readers, of our basic reader, and also that our readers feel a little bit um, are intimidated. Um, they, they, so that's why readers don't really, um, for the front end, which is the most important, what readers are looking for is somebody that they can trust because they know they'll never really understand all these terms. It's like talking to an insurance agent, you know? You know, you're never going to know what the hell you're buying, but at least if the guy seems honest, you're, you're willing to go ahead. And so I think that's why. So there, so some people are looking for a person that has the same geopolitical views. Some people are looking for somebody that has the same like moral, ethical views. Uh, some people are looking for somebody that has the kind of approach to um, living life like little bits and pieces making you know that 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 mm -hmm. makes them feel comfortable and so that's what all that other stuff is really about it's about that that what you're doing is you're introducing yourself to people that you know want to uh be in the investment business you know in the individual investment business but um th but they're amateurs and they know they'll always be amateurs so they need guidance and they don't want to be taken but they're not idiots you know they know that they're vulnerable to be taking attention, to be taking advantage of. And so they do what the only thing you can do, they use their emotional intelligence to try to figure out whether the person that um, they're thinking about subscribing to is uh, trustworthy and knowledgeable and so on. Oh, I love that. That's, that's an interesting like way to frame it, that they're using their emotional intelligence on that, which makes total sense because there's this big element of identity then in what they buy. Like I will buy from yeah. a person who's this, but I wouldn't buy from. Right. But I'm glad you said that because now I, I, there's a uh, corollary, uh, contrary corollary to that, which is that in, in every, and this is more for publishers than for copywriters, but in, within every group uh, of 10,000 or hundred thousand or a million um, subscribers, financial newsletter subscribers, there's a portion, there's always a portion of them that are like crazy traders and want to make crazy money. And they exist in every, in every, um, <laughs> in, in every segment. I mean, I, you know, I, I remember, you know, my partner, Bill Bonner, he writes just, you know, everything is doom and gloom. And I remember seeing, he wrote one particularly, you know, gloomy piece about, how you should just never get near stocks and they're all terrible. And then right after that, they like right in the middle of it was like a little ad for another service. And the ad said like, how to make a thousand times your money or whatever. And I looked at the numbers and that thing was exploding. And people were, you know, they took a pause from hearing why they should never invest in stocks. Now, not all of them, obviously, a tiny percentage of them. So you do need to remember that as a, you know, as, as a business person, publisher, that, 
there are there are always going to be some people that um, that just are, are in it to, for the biggest promises and uh, uh, yeah. But so they'll be there for you. But I, my my general point is, I don't, I think you shouldn't be looking for them on the front end. You know, look, look for the people that are going to stay with you because they appreciate your perspective, your approach, your view of the world. Well, I think that's it's, it's such an interesting thing because the because of where I'm at in the, in the publishing, I don't have your view of, of as many businesses, obviously, but I, with the, the conference, we see lots of small publishers. We see lots of small trader educators. Um, I, you know, I know a lot of the, a lot of your publishers. Um, and then I, when I, when I see the businesses that's, that are stable in revenue versus the ones that might kind of have like a, a big run up and then they disappear, wow. that front end piece, it, is very much different. It's the the more aggressive yeah. that copy is on the front, it seems yeah. the more volatile the customer. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, hundred percent. And and not just the piece itself, but the franchise itself. Mm -hmm. The first uh, the first successful package I wrote was for a, an investment club. This was back in I don't know what the early eighties. It was the first promotion I ever wrote. And um, it turned into what's now the Oxford Club, which is one of the, um, the publishing franchises. And that, um, that, that has never really changed from um, that first, <laughs> from the first promotion I wrote. Well, it's changed in the sense that when I wrote it, I was making stuff up. Now it's actually real. They really do have this, these mansions all over the place and these great people behind them. And I was writing about what I would like it to be. And, um, and it's so solid, their, um, their franchise, that it's very hard to write a, a promotion for them that isn't, doesn't have some solidity. And of all the franchises, the, you know, the group, uh, publishing groups uh, uh, and investment side in Agora, that has had, it hasn't had the greatest growth, but it's, it's had the most steady growth, continued growth. And there's a lot to be said for that because it's, it's, you know, it's great fun to go from, you know, $100 million to $300 million. But when you drop back down to $80 million, boy, that's not fun at all. Yeah. 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 And it is, the, it is. The Oxford Club is one of the ones that I feel like, because I remember the Oxford Club, they were a big, they were one of the, the more successful ones back when you did, um, at way back with Early to Rise, when you did, you did the, you did a marketing conference. Um, mm -hmm. like a one-time marketing conference right. that you sold out to the space. And I remember the um, Oxford Club was one of the ones, I think at the time they might've been 60 million, I think they said, or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're still here. And a lot of publishers came up after them and have disappeared, but they're still That's stable. Right. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's, um, again, now, you know, if you're a copywriter, that this stuff may not be as important to you, but if you... You know, if you decide to get into the business of, you know, selling information, then it's, it is important to know. I mean, that what you're always looking for is lifetime value. And, mm -hmm. and that, you know, your lifetime value means it comes from, uh, from years of relationship. And, you know, your customers won't stay with you unless you're giving them value. Eventually, they'll. You can fool them once, you can fool them twice. But after that, they're pretty much gone. Right. Yeah, so let me let me switch a little bit because I know we don't have too much time, but um, the the kind of direction of the space kind of going mainstream, um, and that's that has to do, like, I, th I think with the fact that you know we've been in a bull market of a self-directed investor for probably close to ten years, and that's going to continue. I think it's like generational kind of transformation of how people you know choose to invest. Like, where do you what do you think the direction of the industry is? Um, uh, well, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know the answer. Um, there are times when I think uh, the, that we're at the end of our industry. Honestly, I think that there are, there are between, um, well, between, well, I would just say because of the general, um, the way the, the media has developed, um, the... Uh, access to alternative information, the ability of uh, regulators to uh, squash things. Um, you know, I've seen, I've seen uh, 
other sectors of our general industry disappear. And sometimes I think this may be true to us. However, so far it hasn't, excuse me, so far it hasn't happened. Generally what happens is you go into slumps and things change. And, right. um, and so, you know, I'm certainly not gonna give up on it, um, but um, it is different, uh, very different. The fundamental way that it's different from back in the uh, direct mail day, days is um, was apparent to me 20 years ago, which is that, uh, uh, and this is uh, something we introduced to Nagora a couple of years ago. For, to be to be a good business today, you, you're going to have to be um, authenticity and transparency are key. Uh, you you can't um, pretend to be a business that that you're not because everything is transparent today. Uh, people will find out who you really are and uh, what you've done and so on. And all these things are on the permanent record. So, um, so on, on the one hand, it makes for a lot more competition because everybody can see what everybody else is doing and, and um, you know, like constantly and, and make adjustments and knock each other off. And so there are many, many more players than there ever were were in our business also the barrier of entry is smaller but also because of all that competition uh the the cost the, the media cost is high you know it's it's like at optimal it's kind of at peaking levels all the time because you've got a bunch of it's like um being on worth avenue or on uh, uh fifth avenue in new york you know having a you can make money there but the rent is so high you've got to have really good game and yeah. so I think that's kind of where we are right now. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's, it's a lot of pressure and it, and, you know, I do think people, businesses will survive, but they're the guy you're going to, since you need transparency and you don't have authenticity, you have to have something solid uh, to sell, something that does distinguish you in some way. And um, it's, I think it's going to be very hard for the, uh, the wannabes and the, the, you know, to the people that are knocking each other off to just, they'll have a, they'll have a moment and then it'll be, right. it'll be gone. I don't know if I answered your question at all. No, you did. Absolutely. I think that, that there's two things that, that first I have a comment, which is the media cost issue, I feel like is something that too many people are ignoring right now because um, I see, so I see a lot, this is, this is the first time we've been running the, the financial marketing summit for almost 10 years now. Um, this is the first time in the history of the industry, as far as I know, where we have media agencies that primarily were serving our space. I have more media agencies in the 25 to $70 million range than I have publishers. Wow. That, that means that um, obviously media agencies are fundamentally a parasitic revenue model, right? They, right. They're only as big as a percentage of their customer base right. and their customer base now includes a different mix of, of people where we have, um, actual issuers like the reggae and crowdfunding space they, that that is reliant on either a newsletter covering the, the 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 issue or a marketing campaign and i've seen guys doing a reggae campaign and they're spending ten thousand dollars a day on facebook um to fill it and so the media just from that one segment um competition is coming then we see some of these other platforms that are that are um, coming in and trying to go after the investor. Um, there's a lot more money coming into the space, which right. is going to increase click competition. Right. So I think you're right. Like that, the yeah. you have to have a higher level of game right. just to stay alive in yes. scale. Yeah. yeah, and there's some good and some bad about it. The, the good is that, um, uh, it, in other words, in other words, what's happening is we're starting to compete with um, with actual like. Um, Money management firms, mm -hmm. hedge funds, and so on. We're actually going to start. And, and the, the difference, the problem there is that for for us in the newsletter industry, a high lifetime value for a customer might be six or seven hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. For them, a, 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 a modest is five thousand dollars. So yep. that's a lot more money to spend to acquire a customer. And the, the bad news is for us is because, uh, you know, obviously we, we, we would need to figure out how to get our lifetime value up a lot higher. But the good news is that when you have all that money to spend, you don't have to have such crazy copy. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Fisher Investments is all over the place. We're very modest, like uh, initial entries. So you can you can have a much longer um, customer onboarding gauntlet, whatever they call it today. And uh, so I think that's generally uh, good for the business. But again, like it's to me, it's authenticity and transparency. Mm-hmm. If you don't have a something at you know an actual business uh, um, product that is is really good and solid and has value, then you're, it's like you're you're trying to build a business on, on swamp water. It's just more than ever, and you need that. And that's why I feel kind of you know generally optimistic. I guess I'd put it this way: our business, as we know it, probably will disappear, but. Um, People that are smart in our business and understand the fundamentals will continue and uh, reshape their business into whatever it needs to be. And whether that means offering alternative services, offering, um, you know, at Agora, we're, we're offering a lot more uh, techn- technical solutions for like uh, friendly stop losses and all kinds of things right. like that that people enjoy. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I, but I generally feel optimistic about it. Yeah, I think I think that the the there's definitely like opportunity with the tools kind of side of the business, but I also see because if I look at um, other areas of financial and how they're kind of moving like reaching towards us in the sense of um, you have platforms, you have you have VCs out there who are trying to do um, media and content, and and really like mm-hmm. I did a big um, presentation for FMS last year on all these different trends, and one of them is how all the business development functions and capital raise functions in traditional finance Mm -hmm. are actually merging with a content media model. Mm -hmm. Um, And so as we see that happen more, I think that one of the, one of the things that um, uh, I've definitely learned from you guys about the newsletter industry is that, you know, it's a focus a lot of times on alternative ideas, fringe ideas, early ideas, things that you can't get in the mainstream or else why would you pay for it? Um, As the audience, the power of having an audience and your, the the power of your audience is, um, unrivaled in the retail space. I mean, I know, I know people out there who are, who are trying to, they, they're so eager to find a, a way to get a company into your ecosystem because it's for a recommendation on an earned media basis, basis that, cause it could drive two, three, $400 million in volume for their public mm-hmm. company. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that with that kind of power, I think that, that we're moving into an area like the, the business is going to change, but it's going to be more like a revenue strategy change that we're going to start to see where, um, taking the worldview and the ability to engage us and the investor and merging it with um, some of these VC models um, and uh, or partnering with, with accelerators and groups where you can create something where they can attract a more unique um, deal flow, right? Companies. And now the franchise has unique early opportunities because I've talked to a lot of capital markets players, guys who are pretty sophisticated, a couple of guys who, who you know, multiple billions in, in, income themselves from taking companies public and what they're telling me is that the capital market process has kind of changed so much because so many of these brokers that they used to rely on have moved to asset management models that they want publishers to come in work with them to to earlier be, and, and get customers into deals way earlier than they ever would have allowed them er- before because there isn't anybody in that spot that could um, fill that piece of the, the capital life cycle and so just, we have one guy, um, he was, uh, this guy, Dr. Ghosh, he was the um, head of macroeconomics for Mubadala, which is the UAE sovereign wealth fund. He invests like, um, he, he worked at Bridgewater, raised a billion or something like that for, for, for them. Um, and he's all about impact investing and alternative energy and things like that. And he gets chunks of, of uh, deal flow from companies that are raising with Bill Gates's family office or his, or his breakthrough energy, his VC fund. And he's saying, well, maybe I could find relationships in the publishing world to c- slice off pieces of these deals that are getting in at the same time as those guys. We're talking about some of the most sophisticated investors in like alternative energy. And if he, if he could find a publishing partner, he would love to be able to take that and say, Hey, now we have customers who can co-invest at the same time as these traditionally like, you know, A-level investors um, because that capital power all of a sudden is there. Um, and so I, I, I believe fundamentally that that is one of those areas that we're going to see. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah I, I think you're right. We have one of our, 
or superstars is very much, you know, working towards that as business. I mean, for, for Bill and for me, it, it's, um, it brings us away from uh, what we, what we're interested in doing, staying on the idea side and uh, staying on the, behind the First Amendment and so on. But um, yeah, but I, I think you're probably right. It, it, it's just, it's the, the logic of moving that direction is so strong and the, the rewards are so evident that I, I don't see how people <laughs> to resist to tell you the truth. Yeah. It's more of, a, it's more of a question of like, how do you, how do you do it when you have such an established revenue model and, you know, business that's, you don't want to put at risk because you have relied on right. the first right. amendment business. And so it is a more complicated environment, I think, but. Well, if you figure it out, let me know. We have a lot, we've spent a lot of time and a lot of, we spend a lot of time talking about it internally with our, with our small group. And uh, that's great. There, there, there are some models that we've developed actually that I think we're going to work really well. Um, oh, I'm serious. Let me know. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I'd love to love to run them by you. Uh, probably not on a, not a recorded call for everybody, but. <laughs> right. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> but no, hey, Mark, I, I know you have to go here in a minute. So right. um, thank you so much for taking the time. I really enjoyed talking to you. I just, um, to reiterate something I said in an email, like you've had a huge influence on me uh, going back to, um, you know, AWAI, uh, Early to Rise, like all your books. When we started our accelerator group, the first thing that we did was we bought copies of um, Ready, Fire, Aim for everybody. Oh, like, right. You're going to build a publishing business. Like oh. this is this is like direct response publishing 101. Like you have to know this stuff. Um, so that's um, good. To, great. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. And uh, if, uh, if any of you, your readers want to follow my insightful advice on how to um, persuade your wife not to watch the movie that she wants to watch with you and, and how to deal with your bad eating habits, I'm, I, they can follow me at markford.net. Wonderful. I'll post that link with this video. All right. All right. Thanks so much, Mark. <laughs> All right, John. Pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.